This is the day the Lord hath and we will rejoice and be glad. It's a decision. All right. So we've been teaching on new creation reality. Well, Pastor Kerry, how long are you going to teach on this? Till God says stop. Because each sermon is a different particular teaching unto itself. The idea is to cause growth in the body of Christ. Amen? Well, we receive with meekness the engrafted or the implanted word which is able to save our souls. So, listen, God can only use you on the level of your understanding of his purpose and will. So, if you, if you still think God is putting you in the crud, exposing you to the flood, and, and pulling you out of the mud, Mike... He does. Then it's good. But we realize that our God is more than that. Can you say amen? All right. So we have some great things to say. Let's go ahead and go to our scripture. And let's look at that right away. It should be Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Kind of read it together. Hopefully you don't see the back of my head as often as you, you know. (laughs) All right. Listen to this. You say, well, Pastor Kerry, you just seem all bubbly. Hey, when I first got up. I had to find my mind. No, just, just as going. So, now, listen, how many here know what grace is? It's unmerited favor. In other words, it's something you didn't deserve, but you were given because God loves you. I love God because he first loved. There you go. For grace, you have been saved through faith and not of yourself. See, it's not our own works. Works play a part. But right now, it's not any work that we have done, any goodness that we are. And not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So everyone say, grace and salvation is a gift from God. All right. Then it reamplifies, and it says, not of works, lest anyone should boast. See, boasting is not a good thing if we're not boasting in Jesus. And for we are his workmanship. Or the other word is masterpiece. Created in Christ Jesus for what? Good works works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So God has a plan for your spiritual walk. And of course, we have a plan for our own physical walk. But so therefore, for most Christians, what we got to share today is going to be really good. And you can take this and share with others. And help, help cause them to grow. So what we're going to do with this is we're going to show you that, again, there's the physical flesh you. And then there's our spirit man or our new creation. Can you say amen? And, of course, you made Christianity 101. What's the first thing you need to do with your flesh? Look at somebody next to you and say, crucify it. Crucify it. Amen. So we all know that means to deny ourselves, to put it on the cross so that it doesn't get in our way as we follow God throughout the day. I, I, somehow I'm rhyming. I, I don't understand. So let me go ahead and is that the rest of our scripture? Okay. We are created for what kind of works? Good works. All right. So everyone say good works. Stare at your hands. All right. So good morning, saints. Blessed children of God, the most high church, the only actually church of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? All right. Some of the things that I want to share with you today is in James, it says that he brings us forth, you know, out of ourself, kind of like a caterpillar in a cocoon. He brings us forth, and listen, by the word of God. So if we don't have any word in us, if we're just religious, God cannot bring the real us Fourth, what we keep doing is living the old us. Of course, not you. So if you're not in the word, let me encourage you to get in the word so God has something in you to pull out of you. Can you say amen? Because human reasoning is fickle. It goes here and it goes there and it never kind of ends up right. And we're not to lean to our own understanding, are we? In all our ways, we are to acknowledge him Then he can direct our paths. How many know that he has the cattle on a thousand hills? He knows where your equipment is. He knows where your merchandise that you need to have. He knows what your year is going to require. 
if we just trust him and believe in him, and you do. Say amen. A couple other things before we get in this. And so if you will open your Bible, we're gonna get, I'm going to teach you. We're going to go to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. So you just open your Bible there. Don't worry about where the address is right now because I have some more things to read to you. All right. I got to slow down. I'm too excited. Okay. There's some areas, though, we are to develop in. How many, how many have ever ran into, and don't raise your hands, Christians that you thought maybe they were baby Christians, but they ended up telling you they were saved 40 years. Yet there's no fruit of the Spirit. The person gets angry at every whim and movement. Hello? I've run into hundreds of them. I've met people through the years that at one time attended my church and, and something happened. We got scattered. I meet them again and they haven't grown a bit. Still gossips, still talk about their neighbor, still complain about everything. Look at your neighbor and say, thank God that's not me. Amen. So today we're going to talk about our spiritual growth. How we can advance spiritually. Remember, it's God who grows us up. We don't do that ourselves. It is God who grows us up. And he grows us up from the inside out. In fact, there's a song like that. So as we meet with them and as we digest the word. Remember, the word of God is food. It is medicine to all our flesh. Our flesh. So we have to digest the word. And even though we don't understand everything, all of us, we don't get everything. It's still in our spirit. Now, let me ask you, who lives in your spirit? Does he know everything? So the idea is to get your mind into the word so your, the spirit with God in it can start educating from the inside up. The eyes of our understanding becoming enlightened. You see, I was taught in Bible college, you get it here, then somehow we walk through life and it jiggles down and we get it in here. Unbiblical. Who did we accept as our Lord and Savior when we first got? So where does he live? He, he lives in heaven, but also in our heart. And we live in heaven with him. It's one of those godly mysteries. So if you think about it, that doesn't make any sense. You don't, you hear it here, but you already have it here. I said you hear it here. You see it here, but you already have it in here. I want you to get it because Christians aren't taught inside mindedness very much. They're taught, do this, be good, try to help somebody. You got to sow to reap. And they, all these good things, all good things. But they're not taught the reality of God dwelling in them. Once you realize who's in you, your behavior will change. <laughs> Poke your neighbor and says, he's talking about you. <laughs> I'm just, I'm, I'm kind of kind of. Lighten you up. So think about it. So we get into we get into the word. We're reading the word, and so far it's not making a whole lot of sense. But something in our spirit's going, yeah, 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 yeah. It's you know, sometimes it takes us tasting and eating the food and chewing it and getting down into the gut where the gut can take all the nutrients and spread it out. Sometimes we don't get it right off, but it says to read it anyway. And as you read it anyway, it, it, it starts to get, and your spirit man starts to bear witness. And of course, who's in your spirit man? God. And God says, that's the truth for you. Boom. And that's the truth for you. Boom. But if you're never in the word, that cannot happen. And you cannot grow. Because God has to reveal it to you. So you go, aha. And God goes, whoop. And it becomes a reality. Did that make any sense or just look goofy? Amen. So, uh, so one of the other things that I want to share with you, as we grow in four ways, you know this, but I'm going to say it again. You grow in width. You grow in depth. You grow in length. And you grow in height. You're like a tree. And you are the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, Isaiah 66. So as we get exposed to God and as we get into the word of God, God begins to expand our depth, stability, and our width, character. You're not an old character anymore. You're producing a God character. Can you say amen? And your breadth, 
your endurance. This is not a 100-yard dash. If it doesn't work, you're quitting tomorrow. This is an endurance lifetime run with God. And even though most of the time we will walk and we sleep, it's still a walk with God. So endurance deals with our walk with God. We don't give up. It's the word patience or, you know, long-suffering is the old English word. Somebody said, I know what long-suffering means, Pastor Kerry. I said, what? Suffering long. <laughs> I said, nee, nee. yeah. Anyway, and it could, you could, that could be a drawn out. And so not only we have depth, length, width, and we have height. That's our spirituality. God wants us to develop spiritually. Can you say amen? He doesn't want us to be spiritually ignorant. In fact, you can read about the gifts. Don't be ignorant. About how the devil works. Don't be ignorant. And it says about how and who you are in Christ. Don't be ignorant. The idea is not to be ignorant. So to to embrace ourselves and to read the word so that God in us can give the eyes of our understanding the revelation and the knowledge for our growth. Can you say amen? So, keys to develop in God. So, we're going to cover these areas, and you got to 1 Corinthians, so stay right there. We're going to cover these four areas. Building up ourselves in Christ. All right, number one, building upon Christ, the, which involves our works. Works do have a part of our life. Doing good works. We are created for good works. Amen. Second, know who your enemies are. A lot of Christians don't know who their enemy is. You have two enemies. One that's very close to you. The devil and then the flesh. If you don't do something with your flesh, it will do something with you. Guaranteed. When you're all by yourself and the lustful thoughts come, your flesh will start ganging up on you. You kill it every day when you meet with God. You die out daily. Say amen. Thirdly, we're going to cover daily surrender and dying to self. That's an art. Because I, I'll tell you, the one of the most obnoxious people I know is myself when I'm in the flesh. I'm just not a happy camper. A guy running around with pampers. I'm just joking. Because when you're in the flesh, you just cannot give forth any of the fruit of God because we're blocking, the flesh is blocking it. Right now, I'm having an attitude, I don't want to be nice. You, you, come on, maybe some of us have said that. Now, I'm not, I'm not running myself down or teaching you to run yourself down. I just has to be a maturity in Christians that they have to get out of the picture. Now, what I mean by that is the Bible says there's a carnal mind and a spiritual mind. So God doesn't want you to throw your spiritual mindedness away, but he wants you to throw your selfish carnal thinking away. It's because it's the thing that resists God's movement in our life. Come on now. So God doesn't want you to toss your minds. Some Pentecostals, yeah, let's get rid of my mind and act like an idiot, you know, walk around and be led by God. No. <laughs> God wants you to use your mind, but he wants to put some dental floss through it and clean off the mess that plagues us and utilize the spiritual mindedness. And that comes up from him to the eyes of our understanding, spiritual mindedness. Scott Wool has a great little testimony. He was concerned about how to make a part. And he said, Lord, I don't know if I mess this up, you can correct me. And he just asked God, he says, God, I need you to show me. Boom, a picture shows up of what to do. Correct, huh? Wasn't that fun? God wants to step into your mindedness. He wants to help you. He says, once, now listen, once we get off of this planet, folks, can you imagine? So right now while we're on the planet with a spiritual outlaw and our flesh that doesn't want to obey God, 
we need to pay close attention to the things God wants us to know so that we can grow. And not only that, if you can know it, then you can grow and then you can flow. Folks, most Christians don't have a flow with God. You might want to call it routine, but I call it a flow. And when you're in the flow, things work well. Like a perfect day. Hello. But when we're out of the flow, then you find the little battling and stuff like that. Don't be mentally concerned. Just go meet with God and say, okay, I'm, I'm missing a base here. Always when you come to God say, I'm missing a base here, point it out to me. See, it isn't God putting you through something to teach you something. You can throw that right out. So if something not working, you just go to God and take a minute out and say, God, okay, show me where I'm missing it so this clears up. How many here have windshield wipers on your, 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 your front of your car or SUV, right? And you're driving through the rain and somebody says in the back seat, Peggy, hey, turn on your windshield wipers. And that's where a lot of Christians are. Things are being thrown them and there's blurriness and everything. But God put a windshield wiper inside of you. Turn it on. Every time you're having a little step, everything's not kind of working out right. Take a minute out and turn on the windshield wiper and you'll see clearly now. You'll be able to look out of the window. <laughs> Amen. So any of this making sense to you? And the last thing is we need to be faithful and confident in who we are in Christ. So these are the four things. Building upon Christ, his foundation involves our works done in love. Two, knowing who your enemies are. The devil who needs your flesh. Okay. Thirdly, daily surrender is the key. Not surrender when things are going bad. I call it, uh, I call it, what is it? Uh, I call it uh, flood insurance. Every time things go bad, you go to God. Oh, God, get me out of this. He gets you out of it. I'll never do it again, God. And sometimes it's not that at all. Yeah. See, we try to, we try to negotiate with God. Just surrender. Get out of the way. Surrender. He's not going to wipe you out. He's going to build you up. But listen, if you're an old rackety building... And you're not willing to surrender that to God so we can tear it down and build something new. You're going to be a rackety building all your life. And when you stand before God, God's going to go ping on your boards and go, you know, I could have had these done. <laughs> Hello. So, so the last one, of course, is be faithful and confident of who God is making us. All right, let's look at this. Number one, 1 Corinthians. We never told you to go there. Chapter 3. Look at verse 8 through 15. I'm excited. So it says, Now he who plants and he who waters are one. Let me explain. How many know that when somebody came along and led you to the Lord, they planted the seed, didn't they? And then somebody came along and watered a little bit. Oh, yeah, that's right. This is good. And pretty soon the seed germinated and you got saved. So one plants, one waters, but they're all of God. Can you say amen? None better than the other. What was going on in this passage, Carrie? Well, people were arguing over who their favorite teacher was. Somebody loved Kenneth Hagin. Somebody loved Jimmy Swagger. <laughs> I'm throwing modern names in. But they would argue and fight. No. He says, look, it doesn't matter who's doing what. If they're of God, they're of God. Leave it alone. Say Amen. So we always get caught up in the little things that don't matter much. According to the grace that is given to me, he says, I'm a wise master builder. In other words, Paul's a very good leader. I have laid the foundation. What's our foundation? Jesus. And another builds on it, but let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation that anyone can lay than that which is laid, Jesus Christ. Now listen carefully. Now, this is talking about our works. Our works should be done in love, but he goes on. So no other foundation can anyone lay. Then he goes, now if 
anyone, that's us, builds on the foundation, on Jesus Christ in your life, with gold, silver, precious stone, wood, hay, and stubble, now listen carefully, each one's work will become clear, for the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. Now, folks, I was taught in Bible college that the fire are the trials of the day. If you don't have your act together, Satan's going to beat you up through the trials of the day. Never further from the truth. First of all, if you know the scripture, the Bible says our God is a consuming fire. So everything lines up with Christ. Everything is to be lined up with Jesus and his works in love with Christ. So if I do something out of my selfishness and I do it to be noticed, it's a wood, hay, and a stubble. It'll burn up when I stand before God because I did it for myself. I did it for the wrong motive. I did it, I did it, I did it, and that's the key. I did it, I did it, I did it. So how do we reverse that and get some gold, silver, precious stone? Surrender to yourself and say, Lord, whatever you want me to do. And he says, I want you to go over there and give BJ a donut. No, not a donut, a glass of water. Okay? So you go over there and you just obey. Don't do it while I'm preaching. And, and you go, wow, I just feel so blessed. I obey God. Gold, silver, precious stone. So there's two of you. There's the old you, lots of wood, hay, and stubble. Look at your person saying, you're looking stubbly there. <laughs> and then inside of that, this cocoon is gold, silver, and precious stone. Because who lives in you? So whenever you do something, you do it, bring God in. If you have to go to work and, and go through that, go to work unto God. Do everything unto God, it says. When you do that, gold, silver, precious stone. Have an attitude? Wood, hay, stubble. When I first learned this as a Christian, my entire life changed. I realized how much irresponsible wood, hay, and stubble I had. <laughs> Remember, God helps us with all that. So he's saying, anyone builds on Christ, it has to be done with a pure motive out of the heart. If it's done for selfish reasons, to be noticed, come up just to play, to play, do this, to do this, then it's all worthless because it's not done unto God and it's not done to bless someone else. Now, did, was I clear with that? Was that really clear? So if you want a lot of rewards, it doesn't matter what, how little the task is or how big the task is. If God asks you to do it, there's lots of rewards in it. Because God never is indebted to anyone. Amen. Say that with me. My God, My God will not be indebted to me about anything. About See, he will owe no man nothing. And if he tells us to owe no man nothing, then he can't owe anybody anything. So he always pays his debts, doesn't he? So if you give in faith, God will give back. But you're not forcing the hand of God. You're just a smart doo-doo. You're smart. You know how the kingdom works. Everything is a seed. So if you're tired of the bad seeds, stop planting them. Wow. That's a revelation. You have to stop. Try it another way. Amen. Okay. So he who plants, they're all one. So he says, look. Now, if anyone builds on that fountain, and gold, silver, precious, and it goes all through it. He says, now. That day will declare it, for fire will test everyone's work. Of what sort it is. Now, verse 14, if anyone's work which he has built, listen carefully, on it endures, if his work endures, he will receive a what? A reward. Wow. If anyone's work is burned up, which means they did it in the flesh, he will suffer loss. But listen, he still will be saved. So that'll let you tell you, he's just talking about works, not sin. 
You see, because when you die or when the rapture happens, you go from here right before Jesus and your life comes right before him. And you will give an account of everything you did or doing, whether it be of gold, silver, precious stone, out of the spirit man, the new man, or would it be wood, hay, and stubble? Doesn't matter, you're still saved because if you weren't saved, you wouldn't be standing before Jesus. The bad throne judgment is after the millennial reign. It's called the great white throne judgment where you're going to be standing before God Almighty and he's going to boot you into hell in front of everybody. But you're not going to be there. We're on the other side where we stand before Christ. See, most people are not taught. So there are two great big judgments. There's the judgment seat of Christ where the people go in, they pass through Christ and they're accepted. Those that have died or those that are going to be in the rapture. Then there are those that rejected God all their life. They're going to go into a holding area called in hell called, you know, Sheol or the holding area. And then when the great judgment comes and everything is righted, all the wicked, all the dead that hated God, all the evil ones, the evil spirits, everything, all stand before a huge judgment seat. And God's going to say, this is all your chances and you blew it. The thing's going to open up and they're going to go into the lake of fire. So nobody's in the lake of fire right now. It's waiting for the devil and his angels. See, hell was never made for humans. We were never supposed to go there. But Satan saw to that. So we either have to accept God, all are called, or, but few are chosen, or not reject God. And there is a way that leadeth to death. I do not say you pray for that one. The way that leads to death is a person that never accepts Jesus Christ to the last breath they breathe. So there's still hope for you if you're breathing. <laughs> Come on. Amen. You guys are blessed. A couple of points I want to give you under this scripture. How many here are now going to produce gold, silver, and precious stone with God's help? All right. All right. Point one. All as Christians, we are built, we are supposed to build our life around and upon Jesus Christ. Do you believe that? What we do as believer, believers is measured by God's love. Did you do it in love or out of resentment? When your teacher says, hey, I need you to do this, did you grunt at them? You just lost your reward. So less grunting and more obeying. <laughs> we can do it. I love you. Okay, so notice, it says that our actions and our works are described as wood, hay, and stubble, or gold, silver, precious stone. Each shall receive a reward according to the what? To their works. Then finally, the fire is God. God is love. So everything that is not done in love is burned up. You're still saved. Because the God of love lives in your... You didn't give him up, did you? So he's the one that carries you to heaven. He's the only one that carries you there. Your works don't carry you to heaven. You bring your works along. And then they're displayed. Okay, say so I got it. Let's move on and let's go to my scripture. I want to give you to show you this. In Matthew chapter 10, look at this one. In verses uh, 40 through 42, it tells us about doing things with the right attitude and in love. Listen to what Jesus says. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. He who receives a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. And he who receives a righteous man in the name of a righteous man, just greeting them, shall receive a righteous man's reward. Are you getting this? Be kind to everybody. Go out of your way to be kind. And if they're not kind back, that's God's business to deal with them. Not for you to grunt or bump about. Because Satan doesn't care. It's all an archon game. If somebody calls you a name, you have to call them back. That's an archon game where he feeds off of that dissension. 
Well, you said and you never, you see. He feeds on that because it's all flesh. Poof, I'm smelling a barbecue. Are you with me? Do you love me? Okay, let's go on. I says, listen. All right. And whoever gives one of these little ones, that's us, only a cup of cold water in the name of of a disciple, assuredly I say to you, they shall not lose a reward. Wow. I, was, I remember when I was in the Cub Scouts. I looked forward to my badges and the little stars and everything. I would go out of my way. Of course, my mom would help me. She was a Cub Scout leader. <laughs> but anyway, I would, I would study and go out because I liked the rewards. I like, when I worked for Boeing, I went right up the Boeing up ladder. And I got rewards along the way. I love that. You see. And all of us do too. Come on, don't be so spiritual. But we want our rewards to come from God, right? You don't want to, every time you do a good job, you just don't want to hear me say, good job. You want, you want to make sure God takes care of you for being obedient and flowing with him. Do you realize how long he's been waiting for people to become obedient and just trust him? Look at your neighbor and say, ooh, yeah. Second point I want to give you is knowing who our enemies are. Listen to this little scripture. This is kind of hidden in Corinthians, but it really says we're not to be ignorant of Satan's devices. So it's in 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 11. It says, lest Satan take advantage of us, don't be ignorant of his devices. You got to know how the enemy works so you can catch him. How many know you can't be as dumb as to leave your car unlocked in a whole city of Seattle full of thieves? Makes sense. Why do we leave our heart open for the thief to come and try to steal from us? You know, Satan's a thief. He kills, steals, and destroys. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life. And you might have it more abundantly. Amen. It says, they will not lose a reward. And then he goes in Ephesians 6, you know this one, 10 through 12. It says, finally, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all to stand. What's the next word? Stand therefore. Now, folks, when you got that armor on, who's the armor? Jesus. Remember, the Holy Spirit puts you into Christ. You're hidden in Christ in God. So when you say, Father, in Jesus' name, God comes down over the top of you. Light comes down over the top of you. And Satan runs and flees. That's why it says in James, just simply submit yourself to God. Resist the devil and he'll run in terror. But without the submitting and the clothing and getting ready in God's dressing room, the devil's going to say, oh, that's just piggy. Hello. You are more than you can imagine when you're with your shepherd. It's not something you've done. It's something that God has done for you. Boy, I feel so privileged, God, it. To think about all the stuff he sets it up. And to think about the Christians are so religious. Well, God was with me for part of the day. I managed to get through half of the day before the devil got to me. Have you ever heard people talk like that? One time I went to church, Scott, you'll like this. My pastor left. I was taught by a wonderful pastor who took us through a lot, took us down to nursing homes. And people got out of wheelchairs and went home. Taught us how to lay hands. Taught, I'm going to teach you these things if you ask me about them. You have to ask me. I'm not going to force it on you. But one of the weirdest, the, the strangest things is as we went in, God would start healing. We carry an infectious gospel. Can you say amen? And how many has ever uh, experienced some supernatural miracles like never before? Okay. Amen. How many has ever discovered you can be quite a goofball in the flesh? Okay, so we're beginning to see that when we have this armor on, we know things that we wouldn't normally know. 
when we walk with God, we are aware of things that we wouldn't normally be aware. Now, I don't know about you. I like that. I don't like not being aware. I don't like walking in the dark. And by the way, I don't like when it's cold. I'm a warm, nice and even, 80 degree and less type of person. I don't like chiseling through the ice and mushing through the snow with the huskies, you know. But I'm, I'm so we all know the level of how God is guiding us and what is our zones that he wants to put us. Know the God zone that you walk in. Because when you walk in that flow, God begins to show you things. And you don't have to do anything. You don't have to impress anybody. God does all of that. And then says, hey, hey, look at the guy I came with. Listen to this. God did all the impressing. And then finally he says, hey, look at the guy I came with. You mean Kerry? Yeah, he brought me. You bring God everywhere you go. And you should tank up on God before you come. Make sure everything is under the blood so that you can get everything God wants you to get in a service and then be used as, as much as God wants to use you in the service. In other words, service preparation. How many know that this is a sanctuary? Let me just tell you something God showed me a long time ago. It is not a laundromat. Don't bring your laundry here. I don't want to hear about what's not working. I want to hear you believe. And if not, be down to the altar and seeking God. You see, what has happened is the church turned into a laundry mat and everybody's bringing the problems. They're dwelling on them and take some 12 songs for them to warm up, even lift their hand. Don't shout me down because I'm preaching. This is not a laundry mat. This isn't a place where we come, we get counsel. But you should be able to have a prayer life where you get rid of your problems at home. Someone say amen. amen. I am not Jesus. That means I'm not a fixer of your problem. I can stand with you. I can fast for you. But I can't do it for you. And when I told several people that, immediately they turned right around and got healed. Because they were waiting for me to give them the answers. I don't want you to co dependent upon me. I'm not going to be here much longer. One of these days, I'm going to be gone. <laughs> you too. All right, so let's go on. Knowing who our enemy is. Okay, so Romans 8, listen to this. How many know in the flesh, we can't please God? So this is Romans 8, 5 through 8. And it says, for those who are, live according to the flesh, set their mind. This is carnal mind in this. On the things of the flesh. And those who live according to the spirit, the new man, the things of the spirit. For to be carnal minded, I love this. Carnal means meat. So carnal minded means meathead. Carnal, carnivorous, basic words. Come on, come on, stop to. Well, it's not a spiritual thing. Yes, it is. You're a real meathead when you don't operate in the spirit. You know you are. So, to be carnal minded is death. That means it will create a separation. It's the word thanatos, which means pull you away from God. So your flesh will pull you away from God while your spirit pulls you closer. And all the time, God's living in you. Can you imagine that? So let's go on. And it says... For to be carnal minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. How many know things go better with peace? Not Coke, Coca-Cola. Because the carnal mind is an enmity or division against God, for it is not subject to God's will or law. Nor indeed can it be. So listen to this. This is one that's been hidden. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So that's why you start your day out with prayer. You didn't get out of, this, out of your bed in the spirit. I mean, it might happen once in a while, you know, if you're praying all night, but you get out of your flat, you get out of your bed in the flesh. Immediately take that bod and put it with God. Wow, I did it again. So he can pulverize it, do what it needs to be so it doesn't trip you out Get in its carnal thinking during the day when you need to hear from God. Right? Okay. 
Let's go to the third point. Who's our enemies before we go to the third point? The devil and the flesh. So Satan really can't get to your spirit. He can't go into your heart. So he has to appeal to your flesh. Every man's tempted when he's drawn away of his own desires and flesh. Okay. So if you're a Christian, then don't come to church in the flesh. Hello. If we do, I have a policy. We're going to put you out in the parking lot with the laundry. I don't want that. I can't do that. I'm not going to do that. But you know, somebody that's really focused on what's wrong with their life will disrupt the entire service to get their way. That is not God. In fact, Satan uses that. That's why the policy here, or what we'd like to see here, is you deal all your, your nasty stuff and who you're mad at with at home. Don't even bring it here. You're here to tank up. This is a gas station, not a laundry mat. You come to get tanked up, filled up. You get your, you know, your tabs and everything lined up. You got your oil changed. Remember when the service station man would come out and do all those things for you? They don't even do that in Oregon. They'll pump your gas, but don't want to ask them to do a window. But, you know, so this is exactly what we need to really, really, really understand. All right, say I got it. So what do we do about that? We have to daily surrender so the enemy doesn't get under our skin. You have to. It, it doesn't, it's not hard. Can I go right through it? I come to the Father. I can't even walk to my chair. I have just a plain chair. kind of looks like the one in there. But, uh, but uh, and I, so as I'm walking the chair with my coffee and everything, I just start to weep because the anointing where I meet with God is there. It's not any really special place other than in my heart. So as I go, and I just start to weep. And I ask God about that. He says, am I losing it? He says, son, I need you soft before me. So you don't make up your mind on what you want to hear instead of what I need to tell you. And he says, when you come to be in my presence, I need you rather to listen rather than to speak. Because you have two ears and two eyes. So I need you really to listen and to see what I'm trying to impress upon you. Now realize, son, that it's already alive in your heart, but it's in seed. So I need to grow you up within yourself. And so I begin to weep and talk. And then after I do that and ask God to fix me and adjust me, and there are some areas of my life I'm not probably aware of that needs to be tweaked. You know, ba -bing. so I become a better person, a better preacher, a better father, a better husband, a better grandfather, and a better friend for you guys. That's what I pray when I'm dealing with my face-to-face -face relation. And then from there, I snap off and I start going through your lists. Lord, I lift up Peggy and I thank you for her and her entire family. I thank you that you will visit each one and tell them how important it is to have Jesus the center of their life. Bless her, prosper, teach her, Lord God, what it is is trying to get a hold of her breathing. And I'll go through that. It'll be at least a minute for every one of you and your families. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, it's hard to talk about this. And I don't want you to think it's a brag. But I would, if I could give my soul, I wish you would do that. Just start going through the list. And, and if you're not sure who they are, start making one. And just pray that extra time, that minute or so over them and their families. Lord, the decisions that they make. And just go through it purposely. You see. So you have your face-to-face -face time. And then God encourages you to invite him on behalf of others. Remember, prayer is mostly inviting God on the behalf of others who might not know to ask him. Somebody did that for me when I was doing my thing. Somebody probably pointed their finger at me, Sherry, and said, get him, God. Save that hooligan, you know. Come on. And aren't you glad they did? I asked God, I said, when I get it to heaven, I want everybody that's ever spoken in my life about God, especially ones I probably hurt their feelings. Line them up, Lord. I want to meet everyone. Shake their hand. After I meet you, of course. All right. <laughs> Face to face. All right, so let's go on. So how many here know in the flesh you can't do what? So are you going to stay in the flesh very long? No. All right, daily surrender. Go with me to Matthew 16, please. Verse 24 through 27. We'll finish up with you. It 
It's my desire that you be blessed for what I share with you. Don't you ever feel like I'm picking on you. I might joke with you or I might make get you to, you know, to think about something. But the idea behind it is, is you and God, sweetheart, and you and God, friend of God, and going after it. That's what's going to do it. That's what's going to do it. A lot of our heroes, a lot of our good preachers have gone on to be with God. I mean, Ken Fagan and, you know, Oral Roberts. I mean, I, I want, that's just a few. Lots of them are getting up and, just, you know, Billy Graham. And I mean, some of these people are priceless because they had such gifts. Who's going to step up and replace? You might not be able to replace them personally or their personality, of course. But we need evangelists. We need people to be bold. We need people to know how to walk in the spirit. Say amen. All right, verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, how many are desiring to come after him? Get this first little suggestion. This is Jesus' suggestion 101. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself. People that have arguments and fight with others, there's a lot of self. If you deny yourself, then a quiet answer turns away wrath. If you have to say something, don't. A humble person will back off. Why? Because then God steps in. Can you say amen? Now, let's read this again. See if you get this. This is good. He says, he says, you must first deny himself, take up his cross. Now, that's an old English word means take up your death daily. Jesus was crucified on a cross. cross. He died for us, didn't he? Well, there's one thing that wants to live should be dead daily. So take up your cross, put your flesh on it, and keep it there. Take up your cross, die daily. Now remember, he says, if you want to follow me, you got to do this. Now, how many Christians out there do you think is first on their own list? They're the ones that go to church when they want to. They're the ones that criticize people. They're the ones that are always talking down about this because they're so special and they're missing everything God wants to teach them. And that's why their lives are crushed and smashed. They are trying to live for God in their own righteousness and it does not work. So listen to this. This is something. And, oh, I love you to God. And it goes on and he says, for what profit is uh, profit? I got to do it. For what profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man will come in His glory and the glory of the Father and His angels, and He will what? Reward each according to His. So let's start getting on the good works program. Can you say amen? Amen. If you're going to brown nose anybody, do it with God. I'm just joking. <laughs> amen. Get on his good list. I don't want to get up in the morning and start to pray and, and all of a sudden I hear God say, oh, it's you again. <laughs> I'm joking, Mike. Can you smile? <laughs> I hope he's getting all of this. I don't want him to, you know, okay couple of things I want to give you, okay? He will reward us according to our own works. To grow and to walk in peace, we must die out to our flesh. Amen. Sin and its nature, which are in our flesh, contain the pride that God has to resist. Remember the spirit resists the? Proud gives grace to the? So therefore, James says, humble yourself under the mighty hand. Peter says, humble yourself. Both of them suffered with pride. So they knew that as they humbled themselves, God was able from freer to work. Can you say amen? amen? All right. So that scripture says the very same thing. That we need to be careful to not get self-exalted. Right? 
And he says, look, what does it profit anyone to gain everything without God? It doesn't. Two, we are, as believers, are to deny ourselves and die to our flesh. We do that when we're meeting with God on a daily basis. You just say, Lord, crucify me. Here I come. I've got the dirty laundry with me. <laughs> come on, laugh. Go ahead. Please don't bring your dirty laundry to church. Huh. You know? <laughs> you know? No, we, meet, we give it to God. He's our laundry, laundry person. Amen. My wife says she loves to do laundry. We won't go there. I have a lot of cute things to say about that. All right. Thirdly, taking up our cross is dying out to our selfishness daily. Therefore, God can build in our heart gold, silver, and precious stone. Now, if you just remember, if you put fire on gold, it just purifies. You put fire on silver, it purifies because all those slag rays at the top, they scrape it off and it becomes pure. You can only get so pure when it's gold or silver. And precious stone, you put fire on precious stone, all you get is charcoal dark, so you just wipe it off. Amen? But God is trying to tell us through Paul, every labor you do has to be Christ-centered so that you're rewarded and you can grow in the Lord. Amen. How many here sense the little growth since you've been coming here? If not, we'll have somebody point it out to you. <laughs> I remember Joanna, she'll love this. She says, I don't even know if I'm growing. I said, hey, everybody, is Joanna growing? Everybody went, yes! Sometimes we don't notice our own state. But tell others, point it out. You are growing. The word is working in you. Amen. So we have to daily surrender. Because what is the one part that you have that always wants to resurrect itself? All right. So listen to this scripture. This is in Matthew 10, 38 and 39. This is a good one to get. Now remember, this is over in the Old Testament. Jesus hadn't died and rose again yet. So he's, he's talking rather harshly, but it gets us to think and have a change of thought, okay? Matthew 10, verse 38. And he said, who does not take up the, his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Same Jesus. He's saying, if you're not willing to die to yourself, you'll fall at every turn. You'll be such a disaster. You won't be able to even keep up. Now that's not you. Can you say amen? When we hear a scripture like that, it makes us think, but it doesn't, if it doesn't, if, if it's a three and you're a six, don't put the shoe on. <laughs> if it describes you, go to God and ask for help. But if it doesn't describe you, don't claim it to you if you're not capable of doing this. Say amen. All right. And he who finds his life. Oh boy, I got a good life. I'm going to take my ease. I'm going to do my thing. We'll lose it. Why? If we all get caught. Now, this is a simple answer. We all get caught up in what we're doing and all the good things that we're doing and all the great things that are coming together because we're doing them. We have no protection. We're standing out there giving us the glory. Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar did that and he turned into a cow and ate grass for a period of years. Thank God we're not in the Old Testament. When you start lolling on your goodness and your house and all the things that God is doing for you, you better make sure God's out in the front. God gets the glory. Because Satan's going to just mess you up. Also, go back into your patterns. Remember where you were, what you went through to get where you are now, only long enough to not repeat the dumb stuff. Don't look at me in that tone of voice. Satan runs algorithms on you. He watches your patterns. 
if he saw Carrie mess up with something years ago and it really blew him up, and now Carrie's becoming the dangerous person again, or you, he's going to try to run scenarios on me, algorithms, hoping that I'm going to do the same dumb thing I did back then. Watch for the algorithms. When things stop in and out of the unusual, don't bite at them. Then you're nothing more than a trout. Hello, I just called you a trout. Forgive me, God. Those are algorithms. So, for example, uh, you went through some hard times, and then everything cleared up and things got better. Then you went through some hard times. These are algorithms. This is not God. He's running algorithms on you. Because you didn't take your bad habits, you didn't take your weirdness to God and have him crucify it, he's, Satan knows your bad habits and he begins running algorithms on them. That's the same thing you got in your cell phone when they know what to tell them, what kind of advertisement to give you. They know what you like, where you've been snooping and where you've been at. We're going to send you a, something to get your money and that's what the devil does. He doesn't watch you daily. He's not at your back door. He sends a little nymp to run algorithms and watch your patterns. The Bible says we're to be like wind. You can hear the wind, but you can't tell where it came. And you can see the wind kind of flow through things, leaves and all, but you know where it's going to end up. So is every man that's born of the Spirit. Satan can't figure us out. Are you getting some out of this? Boy, I got some great stuff in the days to come to share with me. So, here we go. Being confident of who we are in Christ. Hebrews 10, verses 35 and 36 says, Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which have great recompense of reward. For you have need of endurance, that after you've done the will of God, you will receive the promise. You see the word? Amen. We are to have confidence. 1 John 2.28 says, And now, little children, abide in him, and when he appears, we have, may have confidence that we shall be like him. Are you confident in who you are in Christ? Have you finally come to a church where you can hear who you are in Christ instead of how terrible you are? Were you browbeated or, or, or read the news? <laughs> No, I want to tell you who you are. Go after it. If somebody left a $100 bill somewhere in your house and you knew they really did it and they gave you a couple of clues, wouldn't you be after it? Oh, yeah. How about $1,000? Yeah. How about Jesus? Listen to this scripture, Hebrews chapter 3, 14 through 16. For we have become partakers of Christ. Say amen, somebody. If we hold fast the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. Isn't that beautiful? While it is said today, if you will hear his voice, don't be stubborn and not obey. Look what happened to the Israelites. How many were going across the, the wilderness? I don't know, about six million maybe. Somewhere about three to six, who knows? Exactly, women, children, dogs, cats, you know, the whole thing, right? But only two entered the promised land. Now, folks, let me tell you this, and then we'll cut with this. The promised land is not a type and shadow of heaven. Back the old Pentecostals used to see, say the promised land was like the Israelites got into heaven. No, there's no giants in heaven. There's no wars in heaven. It's the walk of grace. It's walking into the New Testament. They came through the wilderness, and now they're in the promised land. There's still giants. There's still problems. Folks, you came out of darkness through your wildernesses into grace, the promised land. There's still going to be battles, but you win them when you do it right. Listen, if I have an entire shield around me that's 12 feet thick, and I'm not in the center of that when the bombs are flying, then I'm a dummy. Put God on, walk with God in love. That armor and God will follow you everywhere. 
the moment you step out of love, the moment you start getting in yourself, stop and say, Lord, I'm blowing it. Forgive me. Boom, the armor just comes right back on like you never lost a thing. We lose strides because we focus and are distracted. You're walking along and something happens and you really blow it. Like you get irritated or you know, something like that. And then you just don't do anything. And you go on minutes just like that. Now your head's throbbing, your body's hurting. Because you won't give it to God. Hello? So, if we want to grow with the Lord, we first have to have the truth revealed to us. Second, we have to realize that we are our worst enemy and Satan needs our flesh. Get out of it. Third thing is we need to realize that we surrender on a daily basis to keep us cleansed and washed. Okay? And then fourthly, how important it is to be confident in the building that God is doing in our heart. How many know he doesn't have junk? How many know he doesn't build junk in your heart? He doesn't waste words. He doesn't tell you foolish things. He's trying to build you up so he can get you off this planet. Can you say amen? Now, how many here plan on going? And I'm waiting for every hand. How many here plan on leaving this planet? I'm not saying tomorrow, David. <laughs> We're all going to leave, right? And we don't want anything stopping us. But folks, let me put something before you and then we'll pray for you. Don't go alone. Bring people with you. Why aren't you reaching out beyond your, your own problems and helping somebody? Let's reach beyond and let's get people. Let's cause them to think about their life. Okay? Say amen. amen. All right, you ready to grow? I want you to pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I'm excited. This is the day you have made. A time of growth. A time of revelation. A time for me to have my steps ordered. Lord, you walk in me and I walk in you. Are you losing me? <laughs> and together we make an unbeatable team. So Lord God, order my steps. Prosper my heart. And help me to be a faithful man meeting with you. And getting my marching orders from you. In Jesus name. Everyone say amen. amen. Lord bless them. Keep them. Watch over them. May your face shine on them. May grace abound towards them. Overcome them. And may in the days to come. They look and give you honor and glory. And may they become soul winners. In Jesus name. Lord bless our food. Bless our food.